Salem read it this morning. The Advent season is a season of love as well. Now, I want us to define our terms well. Uh, I don't have cable TV. But if I did, and if we didn't have five children, I know what my wife would be watching at night during this time of year. You know what it would be? Hallmark. Hallmark. There's just some uh, interesting movies. Um, within about five minutes, you got the whole plot figured out. And then you just figure it, you just want to see how it happens. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a, uh, they're not, it's not my cup of tea. I'd rather watch things blow up, but whatever. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> we, you know what you're getting when you go to Hallmark, right? It's a love story. And that's not the kind of love that I'm talking about this morning. Do you know how much God loves you? I mean, have you ever really thought about it? I don't mean as an idea to turn over in your head a theoretical concept to deconstruct and put back together. I mean the fact that the infinite God of the universe who certainly should by all measures have more important things to do than pay attention to you and me, right? He loves you. I don't mean just that he loved you 2,000 years ago. I think we've got that part down. Jesus loved us. God loved us enough to send his son into the world to be born into a manger, to live a perfect life, to... And you can finish that for me, right? To die on the cross, to be raised from the dead. And we know that up here because the Bible tells us so. After all, that's what we learned in Sunday school, right? Jesus loves me this, I know for the Bible tells me so, but do you know it for yourself? God loves you. Not in some abstract way, in a real way, in a physical way, a tangible way. In this particular story that Salem read, which ends with she laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. This particular story of God's love begins with a man I want to I want to show you a picture of this man. His name is Octavius. Octavius was born in 63 BC. That's a long time ago, wasn't it? 63 BC. His father was a Roman senator and a governor. We know another governor in the book in the in the Gospels. Remember his name? What was his name? A Roman governor named? Who knows it? Pilate. That's right. Well, that's what his father was. Not of Judea, but a governor nonetheless. But most important to our story is that Octavius had a rather famous relative. His great uncle was named Julius what? Augustus Caesar. Caesar. That's right. Julius Caesar was his great uncle. Julius Caesar, by all uh, historical measures, was really the, the guy that founded the Roman Empire, though he did not get the title of emperor. In 47 BC, so Octavius, this young man, is about 16 years old. He risked his life. You know, back in the day, travel was a real risk to life and limb, especially if you went over the high seas. Today, we think nothing of getting in the car. My wife and I drove to Asheville this week, and we had a, a good, my heart is full from this week. We had a great time together. Every once in a while, you need to, you need to have alone time. Uh, Mom and Dad, every once in a while, you need alone time. I'm just, I'm just saying, it's good for your soul. <laughs> and you, because when you're around the kids all the time, 
they're the greatest blessing in the world, but they're also, they take all your attention. And you need time to get away and just be with God. And that's what we did. We were with God and each other. But boy, that was a four hour and 15 minute drive. You average, I don't know, 55, 60 miles per hour. And that's a long way. I forget how many miles it was. You just didn't travel like that years ago. But old Octavius risked his life to travel to Hispania, what we call modern day Spain, to fight alongside his great uncle. This impressed Caesar so much. Um, and you know, one thing that's interesting about Julius Caesar is he had no male heir. That's not entire, entirely true. He did have a son with Cleopatra, but he did not recognize him as his son, his legal son, because Cleopatra was the queen of Egypt, and uh, he didn't want to mix business with pleasure. So he didn't recognize his other son, who became Ptolemy V. On March, about three years later, on March 15th, 44 B.C., a day that we know as the Ides of March. Do you know what happened on the Ides of March? Who knows? What happened, Morris? They were stabbed by Brutus. Julius Caesar was assassinated by Brutus and his cohorts, a group of Roman conspirators, and the, the kingdom was just thrown into disarray. Who's in charge now? Is it Brutus? Is it Mark Antony? Who in the world is it? And... Uh, Especially since he left no male heir, right? Who did he name in his will? You figured out where I'm going with this so far. To everyone's great shock, Julius had made some incredible moves in his will, which was actually read and made public sometime later. The first thing that was named was he named Octavius as his adopted son. He adopted him legally through his will. I'm not sure how Octavius felt about that. I don't know that he had much choice in the matter. But he became heir to the throne, basically. Because he named, the second step that he made, is he named Octavius as heir to the kingdom, and not just his adopted son. Everybody in the Roman world expected him to name Mark Antony as heir to the kingdom, but he didn't. He named his newly adopted son, Octavius. Now, he's only, what, 16, 18 years old now? He's a kid. Being so young, he agreed to share power with a couple of different people in five-year increments. And you know how power, how do power sharing agreements always end? Politically. They, they end in wars, don't they? And that's exactly what happened in this case. After some time, including a war that, uh, he, that Octavius had with Mark Antony and his now lover, who? Cleopatra, that's right. And we know that they chose suicide instead of being taken in battle. Uh, he won that war, and Octavius became the undisputed heavyweight title huh, champion of the world. No, that's not exactly what it was. He became the undisputed ruler of the Roman world at that time. Now, a little detail I forgot to mention a, a moment ago is that before he died, Julius Caesar, he was a little bit of an egomaniac, as a lot of the Roman rulers were. By the way, that's not just Roman rulers. I think many rulers today are also got a little bit of ego in them. But his great uncle, Julius, uh, he likes being called the divine Julius. Now, we, we, we mistake the word divine today. Uh, I might say that a chocolate pie is divine, right? And boy, they can be. Those little peanut butter balls those women made last week, I had a couple of them, and uh, better not have too many more. This sweater won't fit before they come to it. <laughs> they were divine, I might say. And we say that just to mean it tasted like the food of the gods. It is heavenly. But the word divine actually means uh, deity. And so what Julius, you know, when he took on the nickname the Divine Julius, that was no laughing matter. To be called God in the flesh. And so, Octavius, who by this time was now known as Octavian, he became, he took on the divine title Divi Filius, which means son of the divine, or son of God. 
And so it was in the year 27 BC, he's about 36 now, the Roman Senate conferred upon Gaius Octavius Caesar the title that we know him uh, as in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, Augustus, which means majestic one, highly exalted one, Caesar, the majestic one, the same Caesar Augustus that is mentioned by Luke, Jesus' biographer, in chapter 2 and verse 1. That was in 27 B.C. Now, he would reign for 41 years until his death. And during that time, he ordered three censuses to be taken each time so that he could figure out how many soldiers he could have, how much money he could raise in taxes. And so it is that chapter 2, verse 1 of Luke says, In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed or registered. Now, Judea was a client, <laughs> you could say, of the Roman world. And so when he sent out a decree to, for all the world to be taxed, that included Judea and all Hebrews, all Jews living there, which included Joseph and Mary. Now, we know from the rest of the context, which I won't read right now, that Mary is very pregnant right now. Very pregnant. Uh, did you know how far the trip is from Nazareth to Bethlehem? It is not a short skip. It is about 100 miles. Now, as the flow cries, it's only about 60 or 70. But you know, uh, especially back then, you could not travel as the crow flies. You had to travel around mountains, through ravines, you know, skirt around water, <clears throat> about 100 miles. Back then, they didn't have land rovers. You either walked or you rode on a donkey or a mule or a horse or something. And Joseph, being a rather poor man, would at best have had a donkey, right? At best. Now, they probably traveled with a caravan of people. In, the, in our mind's eye, we always imagine Joseph and Mary by themselves just walking along this dirt road or her on a, on a, on a camel or a donkey or something. But the reality is, if everybody that was of the house and lineage of David had to go to Bethlehem, and Joseph was probably not alone on this road, right? Probably a bunch of people on this road. He might have been the only one from Nazareth. We don't know. But the reality is, listen, we've had five children. You do not pack up your nine-month pregnant wife and travel a hundred miles on foot unless you absolutely have to, do you? But Joseph did it. Why? Because Caesar had ordered it. Now, that's the reason that Joseph thought, well, you know what I like to think? I like to think that the reason he packed up his wife, his nine-month pregnant wife, and put her on a pack mule and hauled her a hundred miles through dusty roads and sweat is because God loves you. Mary had to put up with that trip because God loves you. Joseph had to put up with all that consternance and aggravation because God loves you. You see, years before in the book of Micah chapter 5, God had predicted that the Messiah would be born in a very specific town, the city of David. Behold, Bethlehem Ephrathah. You're the least among the cities of Judah, but from among you will come a ruler. So here's Nazareth. Here's Nazareth up there. That's where Joseph and Mary live, a hundred walking miles away. A nine-month pregnant wife. There is no way in the world Joseph is going to get her to Bethlehem, is there? Wait a minute. God, we, we mentioned it in the uh, Sunday school this morning. God made a promise, and God always keeps his promises. Even when it aggravates us. Even when it takes us along dusty trails, we'd rather not walk. Even when it puts us out. Years before Gabriel would ever go, go to Mary, God began cranking into motion this series of events that would lead Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem because God loves you. God does not care an ounce about that census. 
And yet, if you lived in the days of Caesar Augustus, that was all anybody was talking about. He is making us all get up and, you know, what am I going to do for six months? How long is the census going to take? How long are we going to have to live there? How much money do we need to take? It was aggravating. Caesar said, let it be done. But who was the man behind Caesar pointing and saying, let it be done? It was God. And not because he cared how many soldiers Augustus could have. Not at all. He didn't care, not in any real sense, how much money he could raise in taxes. He cared because he needed to get Mary and Joseph to that little town because he said he would do it. Because a Savior had to be born there. He did it because he loves you. God altered history because he loves you. Now, if that's true, you know what I think? I think God still alters history because he loves you. You know, it's funny. Augustus, look at just read, when you read this passage, at the heading it says the birth of Jesus Christ. And from chapter 2 onward, it is all about Mary and Joseph and shepherds and angels and Jesus being born. And the greatest man in the world is a footnote to this story, isn't it? He's nothing. Caesar Augustus, the majestic one, the son of God to the Romans. Just a footnote. Just a passing thought. He's nothing in this story. He is he's just a tool that God used to move one Hebrew couple from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I imagine at some point in history, God was thinking to himself, I have to make sure my son is born in Bethlehem. But the, the virgin I've chosen and her husband live in Nazareth. Now how am I going to get him down there? And he started cranking into motion. A boy who was not supposed to be Julius Caesar's son became his son, right? A boy who was an afterthought in the Roman world became the greatest Roman in the world. Possibly the greatest Caesar the world has ever known. Caesar Augustus. So that he could order a census. So that he could move God's people from one place to another because he loves you. That's why he did it. Galatians 4 puts it this way. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. When the fullness of time had come. That word itself means that when time became so pregnant that it couldn't hold it in anymore. We always had our kids a little bit premature, except for Mercy, she came on her due date. That, that's kind of a funny story. I'm off topic here, but why not? I'm the preacher. I can do this. We were going to her final doctor's appointment before Mercy was to be born. And it was her due date. And we were talking about it on the way there. You know, before we left, she was getting ready. And uh, I said, you know, if that baby doesn't come today, they're probably going to induce you. She said, yeah, I know. She, she didn't like being here. She wanted to have it as naturally as possible. Lo and behold, walking out the door, her water breaks. And I thought, boy, this is some pretty good timing right here. This is the kind of surprises I like. Her time came. The fullness of Mercy's time had come, and Natalie's body could no longer keep that baby in there. Well, when the fullness of time had come, when time itself became so ready for the Messiah, God said, let it happen. And it did. Why? Because God is an orderly God? Yes, that's true. Because God is sovereign? Yes, of course. Because God is holy? Yes. Because God loves you? Amen. That wasn't the first time God cranked the motions, the engine of history, long before he needed something to happen. He gave Adam and Eve the very first gospel witness, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, because he loved you. 
He had grace for Noah and his family because he loved you. He called Abram out of a land where he was perfectly comfortable to a land where he knew nobody, knew none of the customs, knew nothing. Didn't even have a child and said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations because he loved you. Throughout Scripture, God was altering history because he loved his people and wanted to save them. And God is still in the business of altering history because he loves you. I want you to consider for a moment why you are here today. Why are you here today? What is God's role in that? I know of a young man that was born in the 40s, but in the 60s, he was a preacher's kid. He didn't understand why the gospel was, was important. He did not embrace his father and his mother's faith. He didn't understand or appreciate God's love for him in the least. And so he rebelled against his daddy's teaching, joined the military, nearly died in Vietnam. <laughs> God was moving. When he returned home, he was a changed man. Not for the better, as often happens in war. He became hardened by the conflict in Vietnam. He decided to attend the only college in his hometown. Little, little, little town. There was one college there. Happened to be a Christian college, and even though he was not a Christian, he figured, well, I can get my learning there. There he met a God-fearing young lady, and they got married not too long after that. Though that was a very unwise decision on her part, God was moving. A year later, they were expecting a little boy. Pressures of life began to mount. How am I going to feed my family? Marital tensions encroached. They separated once or twice. Life was becoming very uncomfortable, but God was moving in his history. The best job he could find was about an hour's drive away, so he'd get in his car every day and drive the hour there, work eight or nine hours, drive the hour back. One day, he came across a radio preacher, began listening to that preacher daily. As he listened to this preacher day after day after day, the teachings and the lifestyle and the love of his father began to return to mind. And one day, the dam broke. The love of God poured into him. He pulled his car over to the side of the road and gave his heart to Jesus that day. God was moving in that man's history. He was altering history in order to alter this man's history, but that's not the only history that God altered through this man. You see, that man is my father. When God altered his history, he altered all of my siblings, didn't he? Instead of being raised by a single mother, which was entirely possible at that point in time, their marriage was on the rocks. Instead of being raised by a godless father who would not pour God's love into me, would not teach me the precepts of Scripture, would not carry me to church, would not send me to Bible camps, I was raised by a preacher myself. Now, he was not perfect. I'm not, don't get me, I'm get me twisted. But my life changed that day he pulled his car off to the side of the road. My kids' lives all changed that day. My wife's life changed. How in the world can we gauge the changes in history because of what God does, because of how He moves. How has He changed your history? What is He doing right now to change you, to change your family? I want you to recognize something. He's doing it because He loves you. That's the reason. You see, God's love is not just an idea that, to be turned over in our mind and analyzed and engaged from a theoretical standpoint. It is something to embrace, to ingest, to believe. Here. 
G.K. Chesterton once said that the really great lesson of the story of Beauty and the Beast is that a thing must be loved before it is lovable. I think that's probably the answer in that story. A person must be loved before that person can be a lovable person, a person that loves themselves. Some of the most unlovely people I have known became that way because they were not loved. Nobody loved them. You, you know the old saying, hurting people do what? They hurt people. And unloved people tend, they find it hard to love other people. Now listen, I am not in any, by any stretch uh, diminishing the thought of needing a father's love. I think the greatest the, the greatest famine in our land outside of a knowledge of and, and love for God is fathers loving their sons and loving their daughters. Not just saying it, but doing it, showing it. But even if you never had that, I want you to know something. God has altered history because He loves you. You do have a father's love. It might not be your earthly father's love, but you have a father's love. So what is your response to that? There's only one or two ways you can respond. You can either shut God out, keep Him at arm's length, or you can let the love of God in and appreciate all that He has done to bring you here today. Moving the arms of history to get you here right now to hear this so that you can appreciate and give your heart to Him. He's given it to you. And we not give it to Him. I'm going to do something different today. I know the song is in there. Do you know the song, Give Me, Give, give Him My Heart? What can I give Him? Do you know that song? I'm not going to put you on the spot. <laughs> it just came to me, so my apologies. Let's go forward with our normal song. But I want you to do this. If you need, maybe you just need to come up here and show God your appreciation. Maybe you, maybe the love of God for you has just been an idea. And you need to pour your heart out to God and just say, God, I love you. Thank you for what you've done for me, for bringing me here. You can do that in your seat, obviously. But if you want to come up here and pray with me, I'll pray with you. Let's say a prayer and Amy will come up and we'll sing them. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Father, our hearts.